Hello and welcome to our review of The Lost Ruins of Arnak. Does it live up to the hype? The Lost Ruins of Arnak was designed by Elwyn and Min. Yes, those are two names. It features evocative artwork from Jiri Kuss, Andre Hindra, Jacob Holzer, Franchek Sadik, and Milan Veronin, with graphic design by Philip Mermack. I do apologize for my pronunciations of some of those names. Now, this game plays one to four players, with games taking about a half an hour per player, but that's once you've learned the game. First few games will probably be a little longer than that. Now, Lost Ruins of Arnak was published in North America by Czech Games Editions. Sorry, Czech Games Edition. I'd like to forget which one's pluralized there. In late 2020, and has more award nominations and wins that I care to list here. As a very reasonable MSRP of $59.95 US. Even though this game came out during the pandemic, little has stopped it from taking the gaming world by storm. Mm -hmm. While the buzz about it has died down some now, it was riding a high wave for a very long time. Now, in Lost Ruins of Arnak, you lead an expedition to an uninhabited island in an uncharted sea where you found the traces of an ancient civilization. Searching dig sites, discovering new dig sites, battling the island's guardians, upgrading your equipment, discovering and utilizing strange artifacts and idols, increasing your knowledge, and documenting that knowledge for future generations. All of this is handled through a mix of deck building and worker placement. For a look at the very cool components you get in this game, check out our Lost Ruins of Arnak unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Lost Ruins of Arnak features some really awesome component quality and excellent graphic design. The boards are thick and clear, with worker placement spots being very easy to see. While I admit there is a ton of iconography, which can be overwhelming at first, it's actually all very clear once you learn what everything means. The artwork is as fantastic as it is fantastical, and the components are very tactile and a joy to play with. This is one game that, thanks to clear iconography and the player reference card, isn't too bad to pick up on Board Game Arena though there are some aspects of play that don't emerge the same as playing it on the table, the group. Mm -hmm. Now, the rule book is expertly written and is just as good for reading to learn the game as it is for referencing during play. Now, I will admit it would have been nice if the gold and explorer tokens, the compasses were plastic like the other resources. I really can't complain about anything here. Honestly, it would be awesome if every game in my collection was lived up to the quality of Arnak. Now that we have a rough idea of what we're getting, how about you give us an overview of play? So you're going to start by picking a side of the board to play on. You should start with the bird temple and try out the snake side when you have a few games under your belt. The snake side of the board is considered the advanced board game. And while it's not quite as big a difference as, say, flipping the board in Azul, it's not where I would want to start a new player off. Yeah, it's definitely more difficult and requires more pre-planning, I would say. Now, each player is going to take a player board and the components and their color, which includes the starter cards that are going to form their starter deck after you add two feared cards to it. You're going to shuffle that deck and draw your initial hand of five cards. Now, magnifying glasses and book tokens are placed at the bottom of the research track, which is then filled with random research bonus tiles. The temple tiles are placed at the top of the research track, and bonus tokens are placed on each dig site on the main board. Everything else, the various tiles and card decks, are shuffled and placed on the board in their appropriate spot, along with a nice storage spot for each of the resources in the game. You're going to add a number of artifact and item cards are then revealed to make the initial market at the start of the game. Players then receive starting resources based, based on the player order, and the game is ready to begin. As a new player, you will be overwhelmed mm. with the wealth of options in front of you. Even just trying to figure out which ones are available to you, to you and why or why not. That's normal and <laughs> part of the fun of this game. More options than you will ever be able to make use of. Now, the game plays over five rounds. Each round, players will take a number of actions, with each player taking one action at a time, and the round ending only after all players have passed. Now, due to this, players will most likely not have the same number of turns in this game. More experienced players will often get multiple turns after newer players have passed. But it's a great learning experience to watch what the others are doing and see things you might have missed and options and directions you 
Didn't even know you could play it. Now, each turn, you're going to choose between seven actions, which I'm going to summarize quickly. So first up, the, the kind of basic default action of the game is to dig at a site. You move a meeple onto an existing dig site, paying the transportation costs. Now, these transportation costs are important. Every card in the game provides one or more movement icons. A card used for movement is discarded after use. You don't get to use anything else on the card. Now, there's four types of movement. Walking, taking a car, taking a boat, or taking a plane. Now, icons can be downgraded to a lower version, so you can use a car instead of walking. You can also pay two coins at any point to charter a flight. That gives you one plane icon. Now, after paying the cost, you get what's shown on the site, whether resources, card management, like drawing or banishing cards, upgrading resources, and so on. I'm not going to be able to go into all the different bonuses you can get here. Now, there are three levels of dig site going deeper into the island, and the rewards get better the deeper you explore, but you can't go to a dig site that hasn't been discovered yet. Now, the base level of these sites that doesn't need to be discovered is your go-to action when you need resources and essential in your first turn. But each site on that first level is limited to only two meeple positions, while mm -hmm. all other sites can only have one meeple each once discovered. And even those initial, they call them the camp sites, will be limited with less players. Some will only be able to hold one meeple. Now, that leads me to the next action, which is discover a new dig site. This is going to cost you compass tokens. I like to call them exploration tokens. You're going to spend either three or six compasses and then again, pay a travel cost. Now you get an idol from the site immediately. You gain whatever bonus is shown on it. Now idols are worth points at the end of the game, but can also be spent to gain an instant bonus, again, in the form of resources or drawing a card. Honestly, the use of idols, it can't be understated. It is a huge part of the strategy in this game. Now, after collecting your idol, you place a random site tile at the location and get the rewards on it. Mm -hmm. This tile is covered by a random guardian. If you don't overcome this guardian before the round ends, you will gain a fear card. Now, fear cards tend to just clog up your deck. They're worth negative points at the end of the game, but they are the cards you spend to walk anywhere. Now, speaking of overcoming guardians, that's your next action. Each guardian has a list of resources needed to overcome it. Take the action, discard the appropriate resources, and take the Guardian tile. Now, this tile is worth points at the end of the game, a significant number, and each features a one-time use ability that you can use at any time on your turn. You just flip your Guardian so you've done that. Also, the Guardians just look really cool. Yes. Uh, despite being what seems like a modern game, there are definitely some fantastical elements added with these Guardians. Next, your next option is to do some deck building. You can buy cards. You spend coins to buy any of the face-up items or compasses to buy any face-up artifact. Now, bought cards are instantly replaced. Item cards, when bought, are put at the bottom of your deck. Note that is a significant change for most deck-building games. Whereas artifacts actually happen right away. They get played and then go into your played pile. Now, items and artifacts are used later, like when they draw them in your hand by using the play a card action. These cards provide a ton of different things that I'm not going to get into. There's a deck builder, right? You got all your different cards. You're going to be able to get resource, pay for travel costs, dig sites without workers, discounts on further purchases, and so on. No, artifacts are special, though, as in when they come up on your deck later. When you first get them, you get to use it right away. But when it comes up later, you do have to spend a tablet to be able to use it. And that's one of the resources in the game. And yes, you will forget to you need to use a tablet a few times. <laughs> yes. That is one you often have to remind people of. Now, both items and artifact cards are all worth victory points at the end of the game. Every card you buy is going to be worth points with the amount listed on the card. Now, remember, I mentioned this earlier, but just a reminder that all of these cards also provide transportation icons that will let you get to the dig, to dig sites. Of course, the struggle of whether to use a card for transport or its action is a painful one. Now, another action that can be taken on your turn is research. There is an entire branching research track that takes up the entire side of the board that's broken into a number of individual spots, many of which will have bonus tiles on it. To research, you're going to move your magnifying glass or book token up one tier by being playing the cost list on the board. Now, if there's a bonus tile, you earn it immediately and do whatever it says on the top. You then get the bonus printed on the board for the research tier you got to. 
Now, when doing this, you can't ever move your book past the magnifying glass. Now, what this represents is the magnifying glass is the physical act of researching, where the book is documenting that research. The theming of this game and its actions really are strong. And it's one of mm -hmm. the aspects that I feel gets lost in online play and that online game suffers as a result. Now, if you do manage to get to the very top of the research tack with your magnifying glass, you get a bonus tile. And now you can start purchasing temple tiles. Temple tiles are worth points at the end of the game, but cost a lot of resources. And the more resources spent, the better tile you get. You work through all the research, and now it's really paying off. So rewards for going up the research track are varied and include resources, drawing cards, discounts on buying cards, overcoming guardians for free, getting assistance, and more. The important one here is the assistance. Each assistant you get is an instant action that can be done at any time. Now, assistants are two-sided and can be upgraded by moving high enough up on the research track. Now, each assistant can only be used once per round, and during the game, you can have at most two different assistants. These rewards are one of the biggest differences between the sides of the boards, with the bird side giving you many more compasses or explore tokens to help you mm -hmm. out on those early and that early, uh, early game. Oh, the snake, what hurts me the most is you have to spend idols to go up that track. I have other plans for my idols. <laughs> it's terrible. Now, of course, your final option is to pass, which you will choose if you're out of cards, workers, and resources that you want to spend. Now, the thing you won't get until you see the game played, and I'm going to kind of try to describe it here, is the way this all interacts and the way this generally works is that you're trying to take as many actions as you can on your turn. Bonus actions and resources play a big part of this, and trying to figure out how to get that one more resource so you can just go up that research track one more time to get that other resource that will now let you do that thing is what makes this game so enjoyable. It's sort of an engine builder of, uh, in a way where you're looking to take actions which will maximize your ability to take more actions on any given turn. And as well, one hopes at least, to help with future turns as well with the cards you may have purchased. I would definitely call this one an engine builder. This is an engine building game that uses deck building and worker placement. Now, at the end of each round, you're going to collect your workers. Note, you're going to get fear cards for any guardians you didn't overcome. Your used assistants refresh, untap them. You get to choose one card you keep in your hand if you wish. Then you do a funky thing. You're going to shuffle your discarded cards and put them at the bottom of your deck. Then draw five new cards. Now, this is a notable difference for most deck building games. Yes, that combined with the fact that when you buy an item, it goes to the bottom of your deck means that item is going to be near the top. And if you have ways to draw cards during your turn, you could purchase a card and draw it in the same turn. Next, you're going to do some cleanup stuff between rounds. The two purchasable cards, the one item and one artifact that are next to the moon staff, which is a piece that determines what round you're in, are removed from the game. The staff moves one to the right, and new artifact cards are revealed to fill the open spaces. Now, at the end of the fifth round, you're going to calculate everyone's scores. Now, this game is very much a point salad. You're going to get points for all kinds of things. The idols you've collected, the item, idols you haven't used, the guardians you've overcome, your progress on the research track, both for your magnifying glass and your book, any temple tiles you collected, as well as the points shown on all your cards you purchased. You then lose one point for every fear card still in your deck, and the player with the most points wins. Well, now that we've got a pretty good idea of how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about the Lost Ruins of Arnak. Does it actually live up to all the hype and awards? Honestly, yes. I, this game totally lived up to all the hype. I would say for us, it was even better than all the hype. It, it, it outperformed the hype. Like, there's no way this game can be as good as everyone's saying. Not only was it as good, it was even better than everyone was saying. It's not often a game gets this much buzz, wins this many awards, and still manages to be just as good or better than the press, especially with our game group, because I've got to admit, a lot of these big, huge, popular games, we just didn't love, whereas this is definitely one we did. Just because a game has broad appeal doesn't mean it's for everyone, but in this case, it was absolutely, honestly, like, perfect for our regular game groups. Yeah, I have to say, I really do enjoy it. Though the theme itself doesn't do much for me, the challenge of the game is very captivating. Yeah, so publishers, CGE, CG, ah, CGE 
if you really want to hook Sean, put out the sci-fi version of Arnak <laughs> and we'll explore an abandoned space station. He'll be totally sold. There we go. Honestly, Arnak is just the right mix of game length, complexity, and replayability that we keep going back to it again and again. We're all actually currently playing a board game arena game of Lost Ruins of Arnak right now. Earlier when Sean messed, he might have been taking his turn. I don't know. <laughs> when he lost his place in the notes. And the physical copy we have hits the table at this point at least once a month, if not more. We also found this game great at all player counts, though I admit I prefer to play with at least three. Actually, all of all our plays, I think three is the sweet spot for us. Uh, the the three-player game is just significantly shorter than the four-player game. Now, again, this is not to say the other player counts are bad. They're not at all. I just happen to like it at three. Yeah, the game is on Board Game Geek listed as best at three. Mm -hmm. And of all the other player counts, four is the least recommended, though only by a small margin, more than likely due to play length more than anything else. Yeah, there's no real impact of the fourth player compared to three player on the board. It guess you're going to compete more spots, but then more spots are going to get unlocked. Like it all kinds of balances out. But that added half hour to 45 minutes for the fourth player does kind of stretch it into that. We're looking at the two hour game instead of an hour and a half game. Now, what I love the most about Lost Ruins of Arnak is, is the puzzle, the deduction, the puzzling out how to combine all of the various actions, the seven different actions, and all of the different bonuses you can get from taking those actions to get the most out of your turn. Now, this is an aspect of the game that's hard to describe without seeing it happen at the table. And honestly, it's the key part of being able to play this game well. But it is so rewarding when it works out just right. There's just a lot of fun figuring out that if I just explore this new spot, a new spot, a new spot, I'm going to get an idol. And then I can spend that idol to get that ruby I need, which is going to let me play this card that gives me this other resource I'll need that I can combine with the ruby to put me up on the research track to give me this movement icon that's going to let me dig at this site, which will let me then overcome the guardian at that site that I can then get use to flip over to dig at this other spot, which will get me, uh, you get the idea. That's a awesome turn in Arnak. So this is a game where I see people comparing scores and trying and striving to reach certain score levels, often competing more against their past scores or aiming for specific goal score goals more than they are other players at the table. That's an interesting one. I'll admit I have not gotten to that level in Arnak. I, I couldn't even tell you what my average score is. I just like looking at the, we tend to keep, it comes with a score pad, and I tend to look back. And as long as my scores are going up, I'm happy. Now, we already kind of mentioned this a bit, but I am very impressed by the component quality here. And honestly, there's more going on here than you think. Like, I don't even mind the fact that two of the resources are cardboard, because those two resources and those only are the ones used to buy cards, whereas the other resources are plastic. Well, the plastic resources are used to either overcome guardians or do research. And it's also interesting to note that all the cardboard tokens you collect give you end game scoring points, whereas cardboard tokens you discard give you an instant bonus and then don't matter anymore. Like there's some real thought that went into the design of this game. that You don't realize until you sit back and go, oh, that's why those are cardboard or oh, that's why they're this way. And I think it's brilliant. And, and this is, again, another one of those big details that you don't catch in online play. Now, overall, I think it's hard to deny that this game has really earned that laundry list of awards that mm -hmm. it has won. Now, I also found the game to be surprisingly thematic. What movement icons you need actually is based on the map of the island that's on the board. There's a big river in the middle. You need boats to go there. And it just makes sense that the deeper you get into the island, island the more icons you need. And then the way research works where you have to do the leg work and then document it, I think is awesome. Like that, that is one of the most thematic elements of the game. And then there's other stuff that, again, isn't necessarily obvious at first, but then just ties in really well. For example, the rewards you get for overcoming Guardian. Here you've got this giant turtle and you had to defeat and even what you need to defeat things even is tied in. Here's a giant bird and to defeat it, you need an arrowhead and you need a plane. Kind of makes sense. You need to fly up there. But then you get to collect the bird token. And well, what's it give you? Well, it gives you any two planes, so you can fly anywhere on the board. Wait, fly anywhere. Are you flying the dang monster you just killed? How cool is that? 
So you obviously aren't killing the monsters. You're it is overcome is overcome. the action. Overcome is the action. It's not kill the Bjorkians. The thought that went into this game is on so many levels is really an impressive design. Yeah. Now, this tie into theme actually makes Arnak surprisingly easy to teach to new players. Like, I'm not saying it's a basic gateway game here, but once I had the core rules down, I was able to give an overview and play in a very short time. And due to the fact that most of the information in the game at that first round is open, you only have six cards in your deck, so you know what five cards people have. Like, you know the possibilities. It is really nice to be able to teach key elements of the game as they come up. Like, I know you must have this and you must have this, so here are your options right now. And as we mentioned, the iconography is quite clear and mm -hmm. obvious. Now, the biggest problem with Lost Ruins and Arnak, right? It can't be all sunshine. It's that it can be intimidating. This is a big board. Actually, I should add a second one. It also takes up a lot of table space. I don't even know if this would fit on a three by three table. But ditching that aside, assuming you have enough room, it's a big board with lots of things on it, and it's covered with icons. And then during setup, you're going to cover up more things with more icons, including all these little tiny symbols, right? And then added to that are the number of options. Like there are seven options is not a small amount, but like which dig site to go to and which one to explore and which idols do you want to collect and how quick do you want to go up on the track? It's not often evident just how much you can do, even with a very limited amount of resources. The biggest hurdle for most players is learning, especially the research track works and how important progressing up it can be. Yeah, I'll go a step further and say it's downright terrifying for new players. <laughs> I cannot imagine what a non-hobby gamer would think of if presented yeah. with this package spread out in front of them. Even as a gamer, I was pretty scared when first seeing it laid out and trying to figure out even where to start and that's with you. I mean, I've got the list of, of actions I can do. I know what all actions I can take. It's still really daunting. Yeah. Like I said, I, I would not consider this a gateway game. If I was going to introduce a new player, it would be with a bunch of other players who are going to be willing to help that player out. Because otherwise, it's not going to go well. Now, another problem I found with new players is they tend to focus on one aspect of the game. And generally, that's because everyone advertises this as the worker placement game and deck building game mashed together. And people tend to focus on one or the other. They focus on the deck building and they're working on buying cards to, to, to improve their deck, or they're all about getting their workers out to collect a bunch of stuff. The problem is that to play this well, you need to focus on all the things at once, as well as adapt your strategy to the changing board. Maybe right now the cards that are up buying aren't going to help your strategy. And maybe placing your worker out isn't the best thing you could do because you could set up a whole bunch of stuff ahead of time to place it in a better spot. Which is probably why I still never won a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's possibly it. Now, what I do recommend with this game, not just with a gateway game or with any game or anyone new to the game, is the experienced players help out the new players. Don't play the game for them. That's terrible. You don't want a quarterback but point out action options that players may miss. When a player passes, say, hold on, don't pass yet. Look over at their player board and see what resources they have left. Have they forgotten they have compasses left and can actually use those to buy artifacts? Do they have enough gold to buy an item card? Do they have a worker left that they haven't placed? Did they have gold too? Did they forget you can spend two gold to charter a flight, which basically lets you get anywhere on the bottom two thirds of the board? Do they realize that they can spend their icons to get the resources they're missing and little things like that? And this is why you shouldn't learn online. Yeah. I learned more about tactics and idea of play in one single in-person game than I had in half a dozen online plays. Plus, there's the whole aspect of the, the different component quality and why they're that way is a huge thing. You're like, whoa, those are used to buy things. Oh, these are used to do things and stuff like that. Overall, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a fantastic game. It features engaging mechanics, a quick play time for the amount of depth, and fantastic components. It plays great at all player counts, and is a game we have returned to many times without getting sick of it at all. Despite all of that, I will say this game isn't for everyone. Despite being ranked the number two family game, this is a pretty heavy game. It's well above medium weight on Board Game Geek. And honestly, I agree with where it's sitting. It is a medium to heavy game. 
There are a lot of options and permutations to consider when planning your moves, and it really requires that ability to plan ahead. You're not thinking about one action. You're thinking about the seven things you can do to get one thing done. There are groups out there that are going to feel like this game is homework, that it is it is not fun. It's all about having to think and plan ahead, and that's not going to appeal to those type of players. This is not a game for people who suffer from heavy uh, analysis paralysis or are easily overwhelmed. Honestly, I don't usually have an opinion about Board Game Geek weights, but I feel like this one might actually be trending a touch low for where it actually sits. I can agree with that. Now, if you are okay with a game that makes you think and rewards you for puzzling out the best series of move possible, you're going to love Lost Ruins Arna. We found this to be a highly engaging game with a fantastic theme and tons of fun that also makes you feel smart when you play well. And that can't be overlooked. Like, that's just a good feeling when you're like, oh, I pulled off this thing. That's awesome. I can't believe that worked. No matter now, now, separate from both of these, I, I have to say, no matter what kinds of games you are usually into, I would try to get in a demo of this. I would get to play a copy, go to a local game store, go to a demo night, find a friend who's got a copy and give Lost Ruins of Arnak a shot. This is honestly one of the most approachable medium heavy on the heavy side games out there. When you look at other games at that three weight scale, you're looking at some Vital Asserta games. And this is much more approachable than that. I have a feeling this for a heavier game is going to appeal to a rather broad range of game groups. And I got to say, despite any misgivings I've had, it really does live up to the hype. Now, before we wrap up, we do want to mention Lost Ruins of Arnak Expedition Leaders. Now, this is the first expansion for Lost Ruins of Arnak. It adds asymmetry to the game in the form of new leaderboards instead of your normal boards, alternate research tracks for more replayability and bigger challenges, so worse than the snake, more guardians and new item and artifact cards with more potential combos and possibly even bigger turn combos where you do this to get that to do the thing. Now, I would love to tell you more, but I haven't actually picked up this expansion yet. Just like all of the buzz for Arnak, everything I have heard, seen, or read about this expansion says it's fantastic and well worth picking up. Honestly, every time I share a picture of us playing Arnak, someone's going to comment saying, have you tried it with Expedition Leaders yet? you got to get it right away. Now, I will say at this point, it's high on the wish list. It's something we're looking to purchase. It really does sound like a solid addition to the game. Plus, you all know how much I love asymmetry. Well, that's it for our review of The Lost Ruins of Arnak. Before we go, I do want to invite you to check out our written review of this game over on the Tabletop Bellhop blog. 